So Tim Blackmore is the uh, Tricor Verification Manager, again based in Bristol. Um, and I think he's going to talk about the challenge of verifying highly configurable verification. Um, okay, can you? Okay. Good. Um, okay, so um, this is a kind of follow-up talk to, to Mark's, and um, one of the benefits of um, being able to run very fast regressions is, um, is utilized um, in, this, in this presentation. So um, yeah, so it's it's about it's it's about configurability of of, of our verification environment. So I'll, I'll start the presentation with a brief brief history of configura configurability in the verification environment, and this will lead on to the two main ideas I'll discuss during the presentation. So the first is the use of configuration files, and the second is something that um, we call the compatibility tool. Um, we we came across that we we came upon these concepts independently, but but I, I think they're probably um, commonly used in the world of software development. And that there's probably many ideas we can get from software development that we could um, utilize in the development of a verification environment, which is essentially a piece of software. So I move quickly on to the, um, the history of configurability in the tri verification environment. I won't go through this table in a lot of detail. Um, first of all, that's just briefly describe what Tricor is. So it's a family of CPUs. And, um, and over the years, the number of CPUs in this family has increased um, quite considerably. So we have uh, new um, product families all the time. And in each product family, there's more devices um, to allow the uh, customers more variation. And within each device, there's an increase in number of CPUs to give the customers more performance. So when we first um, started having to deal with um, a larger family of CPUs, um, we needed to, um, and, and realized we needed to make our verification environment more configurable, so the, the verification environment had to, had to vary um, for each CPU. We started um, putting some CPU-specific pieces of code in the verification environment. So we'd have um, little bit, bits of code which would run if I'm a CPU 0 on device 0, and another piece of code which would um, be used if I'm a CPU 2 on device 2, and so on. So we um, quickly found that this was difficult to maintain. So each time we had a new CPU version, we'd have to go through all these bits of code and see which, one, uh, which, which ones applied to this new version of the CPU. So this, um, this typically involved um, understanding many, many hundreds of pieces of code in many tens of files. So it could be quite a time-consuming process. So what we've started doing uh, more recently is we have um, feature-based configurability. So inside the actual verification code, we have no references to um, actual CPUs. We only have references to features. So features like, am I a lock-stepped uh, lock um, CPU? Am I a CPU with a data cache? And, and such like. Um, and then these, um, then, then a CPU is matched, is matched onto its set of features by means of a configuration file. Now, if we um, need to develop a, when we um, have a new version of the CPU, we need to verify. Um, we simply need to write a new configuration file, which is um, much easier than going, have, going through and having to modify the actual code. So, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, so I'll move on to the brief description of configuration files. So as I said, we, um, we, we previously had um, lots of direct, direct references to specific CPUs in the code, and now we've moved on to feature-based um, feature configuration inside the code. And then this is how the configuration files work. So the, um, the green squares are, are our verification code. So we have a single version of this, and this is fed by a configuration file. And the configuration file maps the CPU onto the feature, onto the feature set. So we have many configuration files and um, one set of verification code. Um, this is, I mean, so this is probably something. I, I, this is quite intuitive I and mean, quite an intuitive thing to do, and it, it's 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 probably the way you're you're doing things anyway. Um, but it, it, it certainly has saved us a considerable a considerable amount of time over the um, over, over the uh, recent years. So I'll move on to the second concept, which was the compatibility tool. 
So the basic idea here is we have a single verification environment to support many configurations. And the compatibility tool checks that this verification environment is consistent with all these configurations. Um, it doesn't do anything that you will, anything particularly clever. It just um, goes through the um, kind of checks that you would want to do when you make a change to your verification environment. So the value is well, the value is, is um, really twofold. First of all, it's an ease of use, so that um, people actually um, run this run these checks before making commits. And, and the second is that it's scripted, so it can be run as part of overnight regressions, for example. So um, all it does is it runs um, steps such as it um, will compile the um, verification environment on all the supported conf configurations. It will run regressions on all the supported configurations and check those regressions against known results. It will check your structural and your functional coverage um, are as they used to be. It, will, it checks that your fault coverage is as it used to be. And it can run your properties and um, check your properties are still complete. So this is um, what's, um, what, what a, a set of results might look like. So, um, so here you have a, a single user face into the results. Um, and if they also pass, then the user really doesn't need to look any further. So we have a set of configuration stand aside and, and, uh, and the checks or the steps along the top. And those checks can um, either say passed or failed or running or skipped. And if you have a, a failing check, for instance, you, uh, you, can, you can click on where it says failed and that will take you to the actual results. So for instance, it might take you to the web page um, for the um, regression results. So you can have a more detailed look as to, as to which tests were failing. And, and why. So we've basically um, basically got three ways, three use models, three ways that this tool is um, valuable for us. So it's or originally conceived um, as a tool to ensure backwards compatibility. So we found that we might have to get our verification environment um, up and running on an earlier RTL delivery, um, usually in a hurry for reasons you might be able to imagine. And, um, and, the, and we found that we couldn't even compile it. And we'd um, have to go through um, uh, some, some pain in order to get the verification environment working on an earlier RTL delivery because the changes we'd made to it um, since. And we might try to rewind, rewind the verification environment to an earlier version um, to save that pain. But then we found that we'd done things like change the simulator, or at least the simulator version, or that the IT infrastructure had moved under our feet or something, and, and even the rewind verification environment didn't work. So what this um, tool does is, in, is it ensures, by running all these checks, that our um, current verification environment will always work with our earlier RTL deliveries. So when we have to, when we, when we have to do this in a hurry, we we're in a position to. And not only does it show that the verification environment works, but it shows that you can actually sign off with it. So it ensures that you can, um, in particular, generate all the, um, detect all the faults that you used to be. So if you've got faults inserted, inserted by something like certitude, then, um, then this will check that you can still detect all those faults. And what we found was, um, over time, we were not able to detect, to detect all the faults that we used to be able to, take, to detect. And when we looked into the reasons for this, we, um, we realized that we'd actually um, introduced bugs in our verification environment, um, which would affect our future releases also. So this is what I, I mean by forwards compatibility. So the forwards compatibility aspect is that it ensures that the verification environment you use for your future releases is at least as good as those you've used for on, on your on your earlier deliveries. Um, and the bugs we're finding I, I would, would have been actually, I mean, they, they may, may probably have become apparent at some point, um, but they would have been much harder to debug and, um, and probably become apparent much later in the project than we found them by using this tool. So, um, so it's, it's added some real value here in, in, in ensuring that our current verification, ver in ver verification environment is of at least as good a quality as it um, always was. 
The third use model is um, when we're developing multiple calls in parallel. Um, so this, this is a slightly different um, use model to the other two in that not only do we um, work on the latest verification environment, but we also work on the latest design. We don't work on earlier design deliveries. And in this way, it, it, so it's a, a simple interface to allow verification engineers and designers to run multiple comp compilations, multiple mineral regressions and such like before they make um, commits. And um, yeah, so uh, um, so now, so because because of the um, improvements in our um, regression flow, we can we can run multiple regressions um, quite quickly, and and ch um, check against check them uh, so check against all the configurations where that are under development. Okay, so the final slide slide is um, so. <laughs> So we originally envisaged that this might take something like four man months of effort to develop, and um, we've so far spent seven man months, and, and actually it's not it's not finished yet, and and it looks like it it might take something more like 12, 12 man months of effort to fully develop, which is um which is quite quite a big chunk of effort. Um, someone so we when we gave this presentation. In, in Reading a couple of days back, someone suggested that we might have saved um, some effort by using a tool called uh, Jenkins, an open source tool called Jenkins. It's not a tool I'm familiar with, so I um, couldn't really comment on that. But um, but I, I, it, um, it's, it, it still seems to me a, a shame that um, there's no no tool that you can buy specifically for this task for the, for the tasks for the task of um, developing hardware. Which does which does these sort of checks um, automatically? Um, the users have um, responded to it very well. They like using it. They, they like the simple use, simple interface, and because because it's a simple interface and it's reliable, they actually do use it. And we do find that um, the quality of our check-ins is increased. Um, we also run um, the tool regularly on snapshots, so we have. A lightweight version of the tool and, and a more heavyweight version of the tool. Um, the lightweight version we might run overnight. The more heavyweight version um, over a weekend. Um, and so, if if any bugs do um, sneak through the user checks, then we find them quickly. It makes them much easier to debug and much easier to fix. Finding them close to the to when they were introduced. Um, and the um, the last the last point bullet uh, there is um, just. Uh, just the examples of the um, bugs we found on our verification environment that I referred to under the false compatibility um, heading in the previous um, slide. And that's it. Thanks, Tim. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> yep. Again, if you just say your name. Jose Bonjour again. So you talked about uh, the um, compatibility tool and backward uh, compatibility, and that you checked for uh, fault, uh, well, uh, fault detection. Um, I'm curious how you do that, though. I mean, are you taking actual designs with some uh, bugs which were there, and you are still checking that your verification environment uh, is catching those? Or do you use things like um, you know, certitude or some other techniques, maybe? Sorry, was that a question for me? I, I, I didn't have the volume up on my, on my laptop, so I couldn't hear. Oh, I was muted? <laughs> All right. Sorry. Uh, okay. So you t <laughs> I'll, I'll say it again. Um, you, you, you talked about backward compatibility in verifying that the verification environment is catching uh, as many bugs uh, as before. Uh, I'm curious how you do that. Uh, is that by taking actual designs with actual bugs, or are you using other techniques like uh, your fault injection with certitude and your know, after? Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we specifically use certitude. Yeah, so um, so we, we, what we do is we. Um, from our known results, we, so we have a, a known set of faults that we know we can um, find, a known set of certitude faults we know we can find, and we know which test case finds those faults. 
So what we do is um, run each of those test cases, uh, run each of those test cases with, with this um, um, partner fault, and expect that test case to fail. So we found that um, we found that some of our test test cases weren't failing with the faults we expected them to find. So I think there's actually a mode in certitude, um, a reasonably new feature of certitude called check detect or something, which um, actually does this for. So Tim, just one other question as well from online. Um, you, you found three bugs in your verification environment. I presume they weren't found by certitude. Well, we what, we found them very early in the um, in the project. So so it may be that we would have found them much later in the project with our certitude checks. Um, we don't actually target 100% full coverage with certitude, so there's always some effort involved in going through. I, I mean, that's partly because we're a, a CPU development, and inherently in CPUs you can't detect all faults. Some faults are self-correcting, like faults around um, cache hits and things like this, and branch prediction. But um, so, so we don't end up with 100%. So there's there's um, a reasonable amount of effort involved in going through the fault coverage results and um, analyzing. Um, why we haven't found them. So this, um, well, so once we found them, it, it is valuable for us to better reuse them in this way. It makes it much easier, much easier for us to, to um, find these kind of faults. And as I say, we find them much earlier than we would have otherwise. Was that clear? Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, sir.